Uh, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, my name's uh, Craig Story. I'm UDI lead for Codit, and I've been asked to present a, a high-level overview of UDI, uh, the challenges it presents. Um, so this morning uh, on this webinar, I'm briefly just going to cover UDI in general, uh, the FDA rule, uh, the NHS rule, and a little bit about the, uh, the different uh, data challenges that this is going to present to you. So if we start off with uh, what is uh, UDI compliance, just to clarify, uh, it's uh, compliant labels uh, with GSM barcoding for all products and packaging levels, uh, produce a set of data for each product and package, and then send that data to a national database to be approved. And once you've done those two things, you've achieved compliance. Uh, ongoing, of course, it's keeping the data compliant as rules are changed or you change your data and keeping your labels compliant, again, as rules are updated or you make changes uh, to your existing data. In regards to the, the cost of compliance, I think it's uh, it's well worth just looking at the figures in front of you here. Uh, the FDA estimate there's around 14, 14 and a half thousand um, uh, medical device manufacturers we process as affected. And they, they put the cost at, uh, at somewhere at 300 odd million dollars for the US and some, some 230 million dollars uh, for the rest of the world, uh, plus or minus 50%. Uh, so it is a significant new cost uh, for all medical device manufacturers to have to deal with. So if we start with compliance for the USA, uh, the Federal Drug Administration rule uh, requires all medical devices sold in the US to uh, adhere to labeling. Uh, I'm going to start here with GS1 and also provide a set of data attributes to what they call the, the good ID. Uh, please always bear in mind also that um, large uh, US group purchasing organizations, uh, Kaiser Permanente Med Assets, uh, have also published their own requirements which go far in excess of the FDA database. Uh, they essentially want manufacturers, if you supply to them, to deliver data to them via a certified GS1 data pool provider. In regards to uh, timelines of compliance, um, class three devices already compliant by 2014, um, class one and two life-saving uh, by October this year. And then the main group is gonna be the class two uh, organizations by September the 24th, uh, 2016, with the class one and the remainder by 2018 for labeling and for database. Uh, and then if you are involved in direct marketing, uh, you have until uh, 2020 uh, to fully comply. So by the end of September, 2020, all medical devices by all classes need to uh, have complied to the FDA UDI rule. Although the FDA has got published compliance dates, um, we have seen uh, group purchasing organizations and indeed uh, large US distributors uh, demanding compliance uh, from their uh, manufacturers in advance of the FDA timeline. So just a word of warning, please, when considering your UDI project, um, do not rely on the FDA timeline uh, only. Uh, in regards to an FDA compliant uh, label, um, there's two really two main things, three main things to consider. The date format for the FDA must be YYYY-MM-DD when printed. Um, if data uh, and labels do not match, uh, there's potential product recall. Uh, barcode must be compliant. Um, to GS1 standards. Um, they're the three main things to consider when you're looking at a, an FDA compliant label. The rest of the images, of, of, of course, are, are your own ISO images. There's, there's two main areas on the label, what they call the device identifier, which is a mandatory, uh, normally a GTIN, that identifies you as the labeler. And what they call product information, product identifier, that's the variable information that you would put on a label, lot number, batch number, expiration date, etc. So to recap, in order to be um, compliant, the data on the label must match data sent to the good ID. Uh, the date format must be printed YYYY-MM-DD. And the GS1 barcode must meet all GS1 standards. So the data must be encoded with the correct application identifiers, the size of the barcode, any quiet zones, and the verification grade must be C or better. If you're using 2D barcodes, you'll probably need a 300 DPI printer 
And please do remember the quality of the label, uh, failure of the label and or data not matching uh, may result uh, in a very expensive product recall. One further very important point is updating the good ID. Uh, under 21 CFR rules, the labeler uh, must update the good ID when any information changes. It has to be done as soon as information goes on the label or if the information is not on the label within 10 days of you making that business change. Uh, please do bear these two things in mind as you move forward and data starts to change within your system. Uh, I'd now uh, like to move on to uh, an FDA compliant data set. Um, you can see in front of you here, this is the latest data set as of uh, May of this year. There will be further updates in 2016. Um, the FDA has its own lists of values which don't match with the FDA, but we will come on to that later on uh, uh, in this webinar. Uh, so there are up to 62 fields. Some of them are auto populated by the FDA. Some of them have multiple values. But again, we'll cover that in a little bit more depth uh, slightly later on. Um, so to summarize the FDA, we have the timelines, uh, it's labeling and data. Um, if you sell either directly or through distribution, you have no choice but to comply. And if you don't uh, comply, then um, you will put the ability to uh, continue to sell your products at risk. That's the message that's coming out from the FDA. Uh, having talked about the FDA compliance, we're now going to move on to uh, what this means for NHS e-procurement policy, which some of you may be aware of. And the next, the next few slides will cover this uh, in greater detail. The, the NHS e-procurement strategy uh, is mandatory. Um, and not only is it product data, it also includes price data. It's mandatory. And data can only be sent through a GS1 uh, certified data pool. Uh, I think it's important to note uh, the Department of Health changed um, the terms of contract. They were altered in 2013, um, mandated that suppliers must use the data pool, as we just mentioned, but also uh, providers must comply with the e-procurement rule. So this has been uh, legalized by the changes to the two major contracts with the NHS. As with the, uh, the FDA rule, the NHSE procurement uh, requires all medical devices to adhere to GS1 labeling, but also the, the data attributes must be sent to a national uh, PIM system via a data pool. And in addition, uh, suppliers uh, must um, use what they call the Pan-European Public Online PEPOL system to receive and send um, orders electronically. These are the main things that are mandated by the NHS e-procurement. In regards to uh, timelines, it, it will be phased in over a number of years. Medical devices come first, um, approximately 25,000. But over the following years, the NHS is going to expand the e-procurement to all suppliers of all products and services that can be purchased by uh, a health provider in the United Kingdom. Um, the four main things again, GS1 data pool is mandatory. Uh, GS1 labeling, uh, GMDN, uh, and PEPOL. So vastly different and much greater in scope than the pure FDA good ID rule. In regards to uh, timelines for compliance, the Department of Health will not be asking for compliance uh, in advance of FDA timelines. Um, and also the current data set that they published is the minimum requirement. Again, we're looking for them to expand on the data set um, as uh, the NHS e-procurement strategy develops over time. Mm, so the, uh, the Department of Health is expecting all uh, medical device uh, manufacturers to uh, join GS1, complete a baseline questionnaire, uh, allocate GTINs and GLNs, um, start collecting the data set, establish internal publication processes in line with FDA timelines. And from the labeling point of view, in the same timeline as the uh, FDA timelines, uh, using, of course, EU product classifications uh, instead of uh, US classifications. In regards to, uh, to PEPOL, um, it's a staged implementation, but uh, by December 2018, they're looking for all suppliers um, to join PEPOL and be sending and receiving uh, uh, PEPOL uh, e-invoices 
do bear in mind that um, if you can do this in advance, there will be trusts that are looking to start trading with people well in advance of the Department of Health timelines. Uh, the data pool, uh, uh, the product publication, they're looking for around December 16, again, staged probably up to December uh, 2018, depending on the class of your devices. So if we just go back um, and look at the FDA requirements and timeline, you can see how the NHC procurement uh, it won't be in advance, but that by the time we get to around the end of 2018, uh, there will be uh, pretty much in harmony. So all suppliers will have completed FDA and, uh, and NHS. Um, I'd now like to spend a little bit more time on the actual data set itself. Um, the FDA has got up to um, 62 data attributes. Uh, the American GPO is up to 90. The NHS is up to 95 um, data attributes plus um, 27 price attributes. So the NHS data set is by far, by far the biggest one. And within this data set, there are some common attributes uh, like GTINs, but also each good ID, each rule um, does have their own requirements uh, and frequency uh, of updates. So keeping the data uh, or keeping abreast of the requirements and keeping your data uh, up to date uh, is what we believe is going to be the main issue uh, for most suppliers moving forward. So just going back to the uh, FDA compliant uh, data set, you'll see there's up to 62 fields here. Some of them are auto populated. Some of them are uh, maybe multiple values. Some of them are from fixed uh, lookup values or choices that the FDA uh, have published methods of sterilization, uh, this kind of thing. When we look at the FDA data fields, uh, the fields you see in front of you, we call these the magic fields. Um, these are fields that once you publish them um, in the good ID solution system, you can never change them. So if you make a mistake on these um, and they're published, then you have to start all over again. So pay, pay particular attention to these fields. Uh, we have found brand name is one where the information that may be in, in an ERP is an amalgamation of information. Um, and we have seen quite a few companies publish uh, information in brand name, which is more probably in product description. Um, and so they've had to go back and they've had to start again. So do please keep these key fields in mind. The, the next two or three slides, we're going to talk about the NHS uh, compliant data set. As you can see, it's, it's far in excess of the FDA. These are what they call the GDSN mandatory fields uh, that you'll, you'll need for each base package. Some of them you'll also need for each uh, level of packaging. And this is the minimum set of data that you have to use in order to send the data via a, a GS1 data pool. In addition to the, the GDSN mandatory fields, this is a set of the Department of Health generic fields that they also require. Again, these require these are required for all base packages, and some of these fields are also required for each level of uh, packaging hierarchy. Uh, this is a final set of data fields uh, required by the NHS. Again, uh, some of these fields are for base packages and some of these fields are also required uh, for each um, uh, package level. So that's the NHS data set. You can see it's, it's different totally from the FDA. There are some commonalities, um, but it does have a lot more requirements than just the FDA good ID. In addition to the, uh, the, the data fields for the NHS, um, it also depends how the product is supplied. Um, if you sell directly uh, as a manufacturer, brand owner, you're responsible for all of the data. However, if you sell through um, distribution, then the distributor is also responsible for part of the information and for publishing that information to the national PIM. So there are some scenarios that have been published uh, on that. And again, we can make those available to you. Um, so just a little bit further on that, if you are the brand owner, the manufacturer, uh, you supply directly, you're the contracted for the goods, then you're responsible for the data, uh, the labeling, submission of the data to the data pool, um, providing the pricing information, and also be in a position uh, to receive purchase orders 
uh, from NHS buy-in organisations and issue invoices via the PEPL system. In this um, supply uh, scenario here, the manufacturer is the brand owner. Uh, they have to provide the product set to the distributor through the GS1 data pool. The manufacturer is also responsible uh, for the labeling. However, it's the distributor who has to provide the product data to the NHS via a data pool. Um, the distributor who provides the pricing data uh, to the NHS uh, through the data pool. And the distributor who receives all invoices via PEPL. In regards to the uh, EU uh, UDI uh, rule, um, it hasn't yet been formally published. Uh, the fields will be somewhat similar to the NHS uh, and, the, and the FDA. Um, we'll be updating uh, users on the uh, EU rule as soon as we get the draft, which should be sometime in the next uh, 30 to 60 days. So uh, in summary, uh, we have different organizations uh, demanding compliance with different data attributes, uh, different timelines and business rules um, as to how to achieve and then maintain compliance over time. So it is a, a big project. Um, they will update on a regular basis. So the key is to understand, uh, specify, uh, develop, test and validate systems and then keep them updated um, as the rules change over time. Um, data pool, GMDN, uh, GS1, and PEPOL uh, will be mandatory uh, for the NHS and, and for Europe, we believe. So it is a, it is a huge challenge. Having helped uh, many companies go through um, UDI compliance, what I'd like to do now is just cover some suggested very, very brief steps that you should be looking at um, as you start your, uh, your UDI compliance uh, projects uh, over the coming weeks and months. So the first things to do uh, for compliance is to join the relevant organizations. Uh, Dun & Bradstreet for the Dun's numbers, GS1 for your, your codes, uh, GMDN um, for the, uh, the codes for your products, uh, data pool membership, we can provide that. And also PEPL, uh, we're a PEPL access point. Um, so you can join the PEPL access point, but you won't actually have to do anything with PEPL for the next two to three months. But join the organizations first, get that information into your systems. But once you have your, your, your GS1 numbers, um, identify what is a base package, allocate uh, a number to that base package, uh, and then look to start placing that on, on device labeling, review, uh, redesign labels for the date formats, etc. And then the key job, the biggest job, is to identify, um, and collect, and validate uh, the core data set. Um, we would recommend that these work streams um, should, wherever possible, uh, be done in parallel. In regards to the data you're going to require for uh, uh, for Good ID for UDI, um, where is that data going to be? Um, some of it will be in Excel spreadsheets, some of it will be in paper, some in ERP systems. And even if you do have the data, um, it's not necessarily that the data is going to be in the correct uh, format for sending to the ID. So gathering this data together is, uh, is, is the longest job that you will have for UDI compliance. So in regards to the data compliance, very, very high level again. Firstly, understand the data that you need and the constraints uh, for each attribute. Internally, find out where it, where it is, who holds it, who has responsibility for change control. Um, start with one base product and packaging levels. Um, as you find each data attribute, uh, identify, add it to your master data repository. Uh, once you have um, a single record is completed, review it, approve it. Uh, and have the data set then put under strict change control. Um, and finally, I know we've we, we've covered an awful lot of, uh, of detail in a very brief period of time. Um, I, I hope you found it of use. And we're now going to uh, open uh, up the uh, the question and, and answer session. Uh, so please do start to ask us any questions you have on any of the topics that we've covered in this in this webinar. Many thanks.